I'm going to, first I will spotlight Graham, and then I will tell you that the Reverend Canon Dr. Graham Boycott, who right now is going to uh, do his screen sharing uh, while I introduce him. Uh, so the Reverend Canon Dr. Graham Boycott, or Gray, as he's known by his colleagues and students, serves as a priest in the Anglican Diocese of Huron. He is the rector of St. George's in the parish of the Blue Mountains, which you'll know as Ontario's ski country, and that's on Georgian Bay. And so while, and he's also working at Huron University, uh, that's in London as the program director for the Licentiate in the Theology program. That's an online pre-degree program that's, uh, or post-degree program that seeks to enable leaders and learners with the skills they need for various roles of uh, service in their own church communities. Um, and right now, the LTH program currently hosts more than 325 students right across Canada. So Gray also serves as the canon catechist to the Diocese <laughs> of Huron, which is an appointment by the bishop uh, to act as a teacher, mentor, and enabler of clergy, and students and congregational leaders. His research area includes Christian evangelism, Anglican missiology, and Anglican ecclesiology. And today, Gray is going to be presenting on the relationship between congregational prayer and relational growth. So I'm going to ask you with your jazz hands to welcome Gray, and I see that your uh, PowerPoint slides are showing and working. So over to you, Gray. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Brad. Uh, thank you uh, also, Jeff, uh, for your friendship. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's great to be part of a team with Brad and Jeff at Huron College, um, and great to be with all of you here today. Um, my hope in the the time that we have is to talk about today the connection between prayer and relational growth. Um, I have two uh, periods of where I open up for a question or two. Um, and Brad, just because the way my screen is set up, if there are questions, if you can bring them to my attention as we go along. Sound good? Well, let's uh, giddy up then. Uh, so I'm going to preface the uh, or open my conversation with you by saying, what's so important about relationships? Why would this be a, a key theme for us to be uh, focusing in this morning? And I'm going to start by um, grounding us biblically by saying relationships are truly the foundation of our church. Um, if we uh, turn to Matthew uh, 28, 16 to 20, we hear Jesus is commissioning of his apostles. He's truly the first members of the Christian church. And he sends them out and he says, go and make disciples of all nations. And he continues to teach on that to mean go and foster new relationships. Bring others into a community with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Share the gift and the relationship of baptism. Teach these newcomers the ways of the kingdom, all that I've commanded you. And Jesus, of course, in these actions, in this relational connection, says that I, I will be with you even to the end of the age. Uh, the Gospel of John has a lovely series of first invitations and imitations. And for me, uh, this has always um, been examples of Jesus trying to enable others to foster new relationships. Uh, if we follow in the Gospel of John, uh, we hear the first invitation of Andrew and John uh, being invited to join and follow Jesus. Excuse me, I'm just going to close my door. Peace, yeah. We're picking up that phone in the office That's next right. week. Or I was hoping it was the kids going to break in, but... Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Something, something, something. Um, Jesus says to Andrew and John, come and see. And we hear that uh, very quickly they came to follow him. But then there's an imitation of that invitation. And Andrew and Peter, in John 1, 41 to 42, uh, Andrew finds his brother Simon, and he tells them, tell Simon, we found the Messiah. And he said, come along, take along with us, come into this new relationship with us. And then John's gospel again sets up another invitation with Jesus and Philip. 
The next day, Jesus decides to go to Galilee. He finds Philip and he says to him, follow me. And again, we see a second imitation of Philip and Nathaniel a little later in the gospel. Philip finds Nathaniel, says to him, we found the one that Moses and the law and the prophets, everything was written about. This is Jesus, the son of, from Nazareth. So we see this early example in John's gospel of Jesus wanting his church, his followers, to be able to extend invitation to invite others to come and know him. So it's a pattern of living out a relational cycle. Jesus reveals himself to us. He invites us to enter into relationship with him and follow in his footsteps. And we're called to share this transformative news with others. And this is the primary purpose of the church as we see in the Gospels. But we ask the question, in our context, in Canada, among Christian churches today, how are we in terms of forming new relationships with others? Is, is this something that we've taken to heart? Is this something that we're good at? What do you think? Uh, do you think as Christians, or at least Christians, I think many of us would be um, today representing Christians who are involved in active worshiping communities, are we gifted at forming new relationships with non-members, and that's uh, implied in all of this, with people who aren't already in relationship with Jesus? Uh, are we um, putting as a priority within our church's activities the priority of reaching out to newcomers? And I just wanted to take a little break and maybe have three responses here. Uh, I can speak as an Anglican from the Diocese of Huron, one expression of the church in southwestern Ontario. Well, what do you think? Uh, how do you think we're doing in terms of forming relationships? And, and Brad, I, I think we can take one, maybe three just responses. I'm curious to hear what people think. All right. Anyone want to chime in? We're that good, eh? The United <laughs> Church people, the United Church people say, well, we're we're all very welcoming. <laughs> no, no one's chiming yeah. in. Um, it, actually, oh. it, it, if I may. Yep. I'm, I'm mindful of Brad and, and Gray of the um work of uh Walina G. Brown who wrote uh, Faith Styles and Congregations, and uh, based on the, the work of M. Scott Peck. And she suggests that we're basically all on a, on a growth curve and we have to come to it. We have to develop our relationships and our ability to um, nourish them. All right. Okay. David saying we're on a growth curve. Gabby, you got your hand up. Yeah, I was just thinking, I've worked with congregations who are amazing at this. And I've worked with congregations who are not bad at it, but for outsiders coming in, um, struggle, struggle to welcome them if they're not already part of some social bubble, if that makes sense. Um, so rural communities who have grown up together and um, know everybody in the community. If there is somebody new who tries to Velcro on or or welcome themselves in, it's a strange a strange reception of kind of alien interaction versus people who are more used to interactions with outsiders or or new people comfort with. With differences, they were they had a much easier time managing that. Thank you. We got one more, Robert one more. and Shirley. Um, I was just going to mention. I think uh, one of your participants is Greg Braun, and uh, it seems like there's uh, some wonderful things happening happening at Byron United Church in the way of outreach. And I wonder if we could have a few comments from Greg. Hi there. Um, That's Greg. <laughs> thanks for the call out. I uh, I would say that that even though our church is 165 years old, there is nobody in the church who was born and grew up in the church. So everybody here 
is it was a newcomer at some point. And so the congregation is very accepting and welcoming of newcomers. Um, and so it's, it's beautiful to see. And I love to hear that. Uh, and, and I think we've named some of the, the truths across the Canadian landscape. Some places, this is a priority, others it's not. It, it really is a learning growth curve for all of us. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna share a little bit of our context here uh, by when I say our, this, this is uh, from your uh, Anglican neighbors uh, overlapping the same regional area. Um, I spend a lot of time with statistics in our church and I've been present at the closure of 60 congregations now. Uh, and I'm a relatively young priest. Um, age-wise in our diocese. At this moment, although there are over 100 churches in the Diocese of Huron, 85% of our congregations are experiencing significant membership decline at the moment. It seems that of all our churches, maybe 10% are holding their own, which, which is a, a trend of, of growth in a certain way, in the sense that they are inviting new members at a similar rate to uh, senior members either moving away or, or dying or people moving out of the community but it's actually a very, very small percentage of congregations that are reporting growth. And, and we're talking about uh, not just spiritual growth here, but this is numeric growth. It's growth of relationships. The relationships are involved both in worship attendance, but also in self-identifying as being part of those communities. We have been closing on average in the Diocese of Huron between three and five churches every year. And that, as a young priest, for me, that is an alarming um, recognition. My argument, at least uh, from my uh, perspective um, studying this, is that there are a number of trends that suggest there is a problem that is common, not just to Anglicans, but I would argue for most Christian groups in Canada, is that many Christian churches are losing their ability to foster new relationships. Uh, the average age in the Diocese of Huron right now is about 70 years old, seven zero. And if you're a 70 year old, just think about the, the types of people that you're in relationship with, the different generational groups, the different groups in your community. As the church uh, ages, it starts to have greater difficulty in relating to and reaching out to younger demographics and people that are different than we are. So where's prayer come in? This is where I'd like to for us to focus here today. Here's a little analogy. This is uh, my youth group. Uh, now this uh, picture is, is four years out of date, so these kids are taller. <laughs> uh, but this was an exercise where they were working together and you can see all the strings that they're holding on to. In the middle of those strings is a ring and there's a, a ball that just barely balances on their ring. And so having to work together, they had to navigate obstacle courses, part of, part of their team building exercises. But for me, this is a great analogy for prayer. Prayer is a reorientation of our lives towards a relationship with God. Prayer is an action that helps us step closer to God in that relationship, both because we are speaking to God, but we also hope that we're listening to God. And God, in this, uh, using this image, would be the center of the ring. Prayer also draws us into community with those that we are praying for, and those that we are praying with. And those are all the strengths on the periphery. Corporate prayers, the such of what we do on Sunday, uh, is, is an activity that shifts our attention, our actions, and our habits from that first-person perspective more to a communal perspective. There are different types of prayer. Uh, the type of prayer that we're focusing on today is really missional or invitational or relational prayer. It's prayer that's motivated and shaped by the invitational inclusive nature of Jesus Christ to draw others into relationship with him and the church. For us to model that, that welcome, that seeking out of new members that we see in the gospel. And thinking of that, that image of the strings around, the, uh, around that ring, the number of strings around the circle is infinite. Uh, and so we should be asking ourselves as, as people of faith, who might, be go uh, who might God be calling to pick up the ends of the strings around that, that connection? What is our role in praying for newcomers? Uh, both those that may show up at our door, but also the many people that we don't even know yet, 
but to God, they are already known and they are already loved. Uh, there is a chronic concern, and I, I will just speak uh, from the perspective as an Anglican here, a chronic concern in the life of Anglican churches, because for many of our congregations, there seems to be a disconnect between the desire to foster new relationships and how we go about praying for these new relationships, if that prayer happens at all. I'm going to, I've got a little bar that I'm going to try to shrink so it doesn't take up three quarters of my screen here. Let's do that and stop moving. That was a little bit better. Uh, I spent three years on a quest after being a young priest who had been present at more deconsecrations, the closing of churches, than any other priest or bishop in the history of the Anglican Church of Canada. I had a three-year quest to go and be in dialogue with Anglican congregations that all shared one characteristic. And that characteristic was for these congregations, they were numerically growing. They were focused on trying to try new things in order to reach out to new people. Uh, in my doctoral research, I interviewed over a thousand participants from these 12 congregations. And I spent 40 hours in group interviews with clergy and congregational leaders. In the group interviews, I asked the participants from these churches what they thought was key, key parts of their habits in terms of their congregational mission. And I asked this question, how does your congregation prepare for or discern for growth? And then I just listened and I soaked it all in. This was the alarming realization that I came to. Out of 132 group interview participants and 1,000 surveys, not a single person in, the, in this study voluntarily answered that their congregation actively prays for God to bring new members into their community. There wasn't any mention of prayer being a way of inspiring or enabling the members of their community to seek out new relationships within their church ministries. Now, just a little word here. These congregations were doing amazing outreach. They were creative. They were innovative. They were trying different ways of uh, doing youth ministry and worship ministries. They, they are inspirational because of their efforts. But none of them were praying for God to bring new members to their community. And if they did, and if they were even talking about it, it happened on the fringes of their act activity and their missional outreach of the church. I asked at the end, so not to lead them in the conversation, at, at the end when they basically admitted that they weren't doing this, I said, okay, on Sunday, the, the one primary time where the church gathers as a body of worshipers and, and, as, and as learners, as students, do you ever explicitly pray to God to bring new people to your church? And here, here's a little sampling of responses. I guess we never thought of that before, right? Or God already knows that we need new people to pay the bills, right? God knows we need their money. Or some people feeling ashamed of considering this. Wouldn't, wouldn't God think that vain or petty of us? You know, that we're asking for more people? Uh, and then you'd have very much a defeatist attitude where some, some of these actively growing churches will say, that's not our, that's not our problem. We will leave the future of the church in God's hands. Scary stuff, at least for me. So here's the thing. Uh, this, this is a nice little picture of uh, uh, my church, St. George's, the Parish of the Blue Mountains. Every summer, we host a community fish fry, and we serve, our congregation serves, 600 people, a beautiful pickerel meal on the front lawn of our church. Thanks be to God, 10 years in a row, We've had perfect weather. Someone's doing something right. We're not going to change it. Uh, but the whole point of this activity isn't to be a fundraiser. It's to be serving the wider community. It's an excuse for us to show to others that we care. But while we're doing this, we also pray. And here's the thing. We pray to God when we're sick. We pray to God when we're dying. We pray to God in the times when we're afraid. We often come together to give God thanks and celebrate wonderful things in our lives. Why is it that when we gather primarily on Sunday, many congregations 
don't actively pray to God when they have a desire to grow. Now, as Anglicans, we have uh, pretty much a, a schedule of prayers that we rotate through, a propers for the Sunday and collects of the day. And most Anglicans just read exactly what's out of the book, and they don't think of anything else. And if you follow in the prayers set up for, for a liturgical tradition like ours, you realize that there isn't, you aren't making any extra time to listen to God or to reach out to God on behalf of newcomers. Again, remember this image of what, what's the whole purpose of prayer. It's to help us reorient ourselves towards God. It's helping us to, to speak and listen. And it's drawing us into those other strings, those that are those people who are familiar to us already in the congregations, but all the missing strings that are people who God is inviting to be in community with us and in community with God. Now, whenever I connect with congregations as a way of trying to motivate them with prayer, unfortunately, often this is what happens. They go, oh, right, yes, 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 yes. We need these newcomers because we need their bums and their pews and we need their money to pay our bills. Uh, there's this little comical cartoon if the, the text is a little too small for you uh, to read. It's a, it's a guy looking out at his empty church and a statistician, uh, someone like me, saying, according to the marketing survey, our church's niche is inactive, non-attending believers. Uh, and fortunately, that's that's the type of narrative that generally in, in our tradition results in another church deconsecration somewhere down the line. Uh, so when we're praying for newcomers, are we praying for the right things? What I'm talking about today uh, is is hard for some congregations to grasp because they have a fear of letting go of things that they have found to be constant. And sometimes the desire to welcome others into your church space brings along change, brings along different personalities. It brings along new ways of thinking. There's a need for a reorientation away from the fear of losing the familiar to having a gospel appreciation of embracing the diversity and the vibrancy that comes from each and every new relationship that our church seeks out and is able to form. So by way of putting in some thoughts uh, that we're thinking about today, putting them to practice, uh, what I'm suggesting uh, for all congregations all Christian congregations, is that we need to reclaim regular habits of relational prayer to put front and center in our worship on Sundays the purpose of fostering new relationships. So how do we do that? Well, um, our uh, music director at Huron College, uh, William Lupton, has this beautiful prayer that if you've ever sung in a choir, you probably have heard this before. Uh, the prayer that is an ancient choristers prayer that says, May what we sing or pray with our lips be what we believe in our hearts. May what we believe in our hearts be what we act out in our lives. And may what we act out in our lives draw us ever closer to you, Lord Jesus Christ, or O or, or Lord, amen. That prayer, what we say with our lips on Sunday, it changes what we feel and act out in our lives. And if we pray to be more welcoming or be more deliberate in their invitations, or if we're seeking God to help us to make space for newcomers, if we pray that every Sunday, it changes who we are and how we will behave going forward. And if the desire to connect people to Jesus is at the center of that change, I believe it can only ever be a good thing. So in my congregation, we live this out by uh, introducing two new prayers. And if there are any Anglicans on the, on the call today, they may go, oh my goodness, you're adding prayers to the service? Are you allowed to do that? Uh, which book does this come from? Are these official? Uh, no, these are, these are complete editions. They are not authorized by any book, um, but uh, they are something that helps us to change the focus of our worship. Imagine being a newcomer and stepping into my church on Sunday. 
There could be a million reasons why you suddenly worked up the nerve to come to church. It's possible that you're feeling vulnerable. It's possible that you might uh, believe that you might be judged or that someone may give you the cold shoulder. Uh, so you're coming with, with a little bit of anxiety. Imagine sitting down, maybe in the back pew, just trying to blend in. And in the opening prayers of the service, you hear this. Prepare us, O God, to welcome the guests that you are inviting to be embraced, served, and loved by your church. Help us to appreciate the gifts of diversity that each guest will bless us with. And may we place the needs of others before our own in order to foster new relationships in you. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who summons all people to himself. Amen. Imagine hearing that as a new member, uh, as a seeker or a potential new member of the church. It feels as if God has prepared for you to be there. And hopefully, if a congregation prays this and believes it in their hearts, they will share that welcome. They will be more attentive to your needs, and they will create space for you. At the end of the service, instead of uh, you know, the old joke is saying, uh, the mass is ended, go piss off, right? At the end of the service, instead of a worship just coming to a close, imagine a congregation being sent out with a little bit of homework to remind them of what they are called to do as Christians. By praying, God of mission and renewal, may the faith that sustains us and the love that you've shared with us spill out beyond the walls of the sacred space. Enable, equip and enable us to speak of our relationship with you to others and to invite them to come and see for themselves. This we pray in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. And if you're wondering where the phrase come and see for themselves, that's lifted right from that narrative of invitational welcome that we hear in the Gospel of John, where anyone who encountered Jesus, their response was to tell someone and say, you need to come and see this guy. You need to come and be in relationship with this person. Uh, some churches already have uh, prayers that have been written at different periods in the church, and they... Uh, can, can be included as welcoming prayers. Uh, some of them aren't, they aren't always as explicitly focused on um, speaking to the members of the, of the church body that's gathered in worship. Uh, there are two examples here that I, I've shared. You will likely also have similar examples within uh, the United Church of Canada uh, prayer book and traditions. Um, but I, I find that you just need to have an excuse to have this put front and center in church on Sunday. Because despite our best efforts, many of our churches forget about these things. And why? What's the whole point of this? Well, if there's one, one thing that someone walks away from this presentation today, I hope it, it's this. When we are deliberate in reintroducing or prioritate, prioritizing relational prayers in our weekly gatherings of worship, they will change our focus. They change our focus from looking inward about thinking about ourselves and our own growth needs and our own spirituality to including, to expanding outward, to intentionally welcome and embrace newcomers and specifically non-members. They will, I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that God answers prayer. It's not, you, we should never be ashamed of explicitly asking God to revitalize the existing membership of the church. Because the truth is, every new relationship that comes into our faith community is a relationship that changes the DNA of the congregation. And some congregations fear that. They, they don't want to embrace that change. But in all of the numerically growing congregations that I've ever studied, what they've seen is one of the greatest blessings is the new ideas, the fresh energy, and simply the, the sharing of faith that comes with each and every new person that comes into a community. These prayers, if a congregation believes them, it implies within that those communities that they have an openness to change. Because it's true that congregations cannot both embrace new relationships and remain static in their habits at the same time. It doesn't work. Unless we create a little space for each new member to be able to change us, 
we won't be able to embrace them into our family of faith that we call our congregation or our parish or our worshiping community. And then lastly, these relational prayers, they change our way of thinking. Again, what we say with our lips changes what we believe in our hearts. And it helps us to see what is our individual personal role of being attentive to new relationships. Uh, when I went to study um, 12 numerically growing congregations, before I showed up to do a presentation and, and to listen with them, I showed up to worship on a Sunday without them knowing. And I was curious to see if I would just uh, be ignored at the back, if someone would sit down next to me in the pew and, and try to guide me along the way, uh, if anyone went the extra mile to make me feel welcome. Uh, in some of those congregations, I experienced that. Uh, in three quarters of them, I was just basically ignored. Um, so that may just be an anomaly. Maybe they're better when they come through. But if you're praying every Sunday to be more attentive to newcomers, the end result is we end up doing a better job with that. Or at least I hope and pray that we do. So, uh, Brad, I've got 1035. And uh, I'm going to ask, uh, you know, I'm open to questions that other people have, uh, but I also had two prompted questions in case I met uh, crickets. <laughs> we have no questions posted yet in the chat. Uh, yeah. If someone has a question, uh, raise your hand. Uh, and then if you have your prompt questions, that may... Let's Let's start by seeing if anyone has any questions in response to... Uh, the presentation first. Good morning, everyone. It's Jason. Hello, hello. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have a question, but I, I have a quick observation along the same line. I have a friend who attends the Mormon church, and he and I just spoke about this last night. Mm -hmm. And I, I specifically asked him about that after what we talked about in our session yesterday. And I, I know that they they actually train their youth and as, as everyone knows, they, they send them on international, um, uh, the, the name of it escapes me, but, it, you know, like a, a two-year um, outreach in different parts of the world. And they live and breathe this for two years. And I was just asking him about, like, how do you train these people? Like, what do you teach them? How do you witness to people? Um, things like that. And, and I think for me personally, you know, I, I would just need somebody to kind of teach me how to, you know, broach that conversation with someone, and then I would be very comfortable, you know, speaking to people. And like, like Jesus said in the early church, like, how, how did they spread the faith? And how could we take the early church and bring it right up to current times and do the same thing? Thank you. Um, I didn't see your name pop up. I, was that Rob? What was Jason. That? Jason. Thank you, Jason. Uh, when I was, uh, Basically, I lived at Huron College for a decade and took a lot of theology courses. When I was a starving student, I lived in uh, South London, an apartment building where the bottom corner unit of that apartment building uh, was uh, constantly rented out by the, the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. And they always had three or four young men uh, staying there. And this was part of their coming of age it was part of their identity. And, and while we have uh, many things that we don't necessarily agree on in terms of theology with the Mormon church, I was inspired by their dedication. I was inspired by the fact that because they believe reaching out in new relationships is so important within their faith tradition, uh, that they're, they're commissioned, they're commanded by God to do so, that they they build it into their development of, um, and of course, this is um, tends to be just young men for the most part, uh, but they build it into their, um, uh, to their, 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 I would call it like a finishing school. You know, you go to school and part of going to school in order to graduate is you need to go out and form relationships and tell people about the faith that we have um, gifted to you. Um, I kept inviting them to, to, to join us at Huron College for our uh, community time. They, they weren't quite interested in that. But I will say, if most of our Christian churches had 10% of the invitational zeal of the Mormon church, we would be in a very different situation today. Uh, I would say that most of our congregations uh, 
They do very little in their week to be mindful of or to go out and extend an invitation. Uh, the following part of that is, do you feel like you have the resources to do so? Has your tradition trained you to do it? And a lot of people uh, that, uh, regardless of denominational uh, background, they often say, no, I, I don't feel that I've been equipped. Or they may say, that's that's the priest's or the minister's job. They, they, they have to do that, not me. Um, and I think that that's a failing within many of our Christian traditions at this stage. Next, we have Doug Peck. Uh, hi, thank you for all of this. I'm, I'm loving it all. And, and I'm finding it so hopeful. It, it, it's reminding me of two things that I'm going to say really quickly because I tend to blab a lot. And, and, the, and the first thing is, I just remember being in seminary. Well, I, I guess before that, I just, I've always grown up in a world uh, where I was told that, that church is, is for, you know, it's one of the three things you don't talk about, right? like, don't, uh, don't push your stuff on me. So, so I've all, I think I grew up as a very squeamish Christian and uh, knowing that a lot of my sort of Gen X uh, friends and, and schoolmates just weren't into it. I, I knew it was countercultural, so I was squeamish to talk about it. And, and then, so, so whatever years later, I'm in seminary and, and uh, it, it came out in a pastoral care class that, that so many uh, friends and colleagues were afraid to pray in a, in a hospital room. Finally, the professor said, come on, like, you got to get past this. And, 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 and I, I think you're really spelling out what, what was kind of said to us back then is like, this is something we need to work on. Like this is a base thing we need to work on. And, and um, I, I'm also just thinking of a leadership class that I, that I took at, at uh, UWO uh, a few years back where, where it talked about um, a study that was done to, to tell a group to, to name uh, as many uh, colors as they could. And, and they, they made a small list. And then uh, another group was given instructions to, to name 15 colors. And because they were given a target, kind of like you said, like homework, um, they crushed everyone else who, who, uh, but, but like, it, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm finding it so powerful for you to just remind us the power of prayer, that it's everyone's job and, and homework it. Like it's, um, saddest, um, one of the sad realities that I've experienced, I had a role where I toured around with our bishops for, for about 10 years, and I uh, was basically a butler when they were um, closing church services. I, I helped fetch things and set things up. I was there to support them. But I also was asking people uh, about their church before they were closing it. And it was interesting because I would do a little walk in the neighborhood and, you know, you'd hear the, the announcement would go in the newspaper. We're closing St. Swithin's by the swamp, right? People in the neighborhood would say, I didn't even know you guys were in trouble. We barely know who you are. We're upset that you're closing. And then you would ask the people inside the churches, when was the last time you went out and met your neighbors, connected with the needs in the community? And often you find that you know, they may have invested in their gardens or they put in an elevator or they did all these other concrete things that they thought were invitational, but that really inexpensive things, just going out to meet the neighbors, they hadn't done that in many years. That breaks my heart when congregations that have been faithful for years have just lost the ability to form new relationships. And then it makes me say, well, how do we encourage people to to reteach these skills, to get excited again. And a conference like this that you're all gathered in today is where the little spark starts uh, to take back to wherever we're coming from. A desire to say, well, this is important. Are we talking about this? Are we praying about this every Sunday? Um, and I hope, I hope that we will be going forward. I'm going to uh, wind us down here uh, so that I have time to thank you. Uh, and, and before I do that, just noting some people are asking for access to the prayers, uh, whether that's something that we can you could email to Rob or Jim. We'll make sure that it goes or out um, or to me. And, I'll do it to you. <laughs> and so, so thank you, Graham, for that uh, focus. Well, from your research, your your insights from research in congregations, and the just being deliberate about 
prioritizing relational prayer, as you put it, um, changing our focus from our inward needs to um, expanding to that outward intentional welcome. Uh, uh, allow me to leave with one final thought because I'm pretty excited about this. Um, we have a, a relatively new parishioner in our church, and he's been excited about uh, organizing men's ministry, breakfast, coffee, and bringing in a speaker, right? We hadn't had a men's group in many, many years that had gathered together. He walked up and down his street, and he invited every single man that he knew on the street to come for the breakfast and to come for the speaker. It, uh, you would think, well, will he have any success? <laughs> what, will, what will the neighborhood think of him? He has five neighbors that are uh, not um, estranged to Christianity, but they, they have no connections with the Anglican Church. Five that are coming on a regular basis and being in relationship with other men. And that was just one street, one person. Remarkable. One so it's not... Not it's just the intentionality, and so I hope that that may inspire someone else to try something new in their own way. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Graham. It is ten forty-five. We're going to take a five-minute break. Feel free to walk away, turn off your cameras, close your eyes.